Hello, everybody. I think it is noon on the dot, so just about time for us to get started. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tori Bosch, and I'm the editor of Future Tense. Future Tense is a partnership of Slate Magazine, Arizona State University, and New America. And our goal is to explore emerging technologies and the questions that they raise for policy and for society. We do that through a channel on Slate at slate.com slash future tense. And these days in online events like this one, this is our first time back after a little bit of a summer break and we'll be here every Wednesday at noon Eastern uh, for the foreseeable future. Today we're here to thread a pretty complicated needle. Um, I think that when I first heard about QAnon several years ago, my initial reaction was that it was a, a kind of interesting quirky, strange thing, but that it didn't really rise to something that we needed to cover as journalists or that social networks needed to worry about too much, largely because I think a lot of us worry about giving oxygen um, to things. Uh, I think, though, that this idea that we shouldn't cover or shouldn't address QAnon um, has changed a lot because it's now impossible to deny that the conspiracy theory is having serious real world effects. Uh, just last night, a QAnon supporter won the GOP Senate primary in Delaware. She will certainly not be elected. Nevertheless, it's something a little troubling to see. And there will be at least one QAnon supporter in the House of Representatives after this fall. Um, you know, QAnon supporters have been accused of serious crimes, including kidnapping and homicide, and the FBI considers it a domestic terrorism threat. So rightly, it seems like the only people who aren't talking about QAnon are conservative Republicans who are trying to dodge questions um, about it by claiming they haven't heard of it. Today, we're here to talk to three experts about QAnon's rise and evolution, how journalists and social networks can or may have unwittingly contributed to the rise, and how they can responsibly address it going forward. We'll speak for about 40 minutes before opening up to Q&A. And throughout the conversation, you can use the Q&A function on Zoom to submit your questions. Uh, so now I'll introduce our esteemed panelists. First, we have Whitney Phillips, who is an assistant professor at Syracuse University's Department of Communication and Rhetorical Studies. Whitney also wrote what I think is a sort of definitive piece on this topic for The Guardian in 2018 called How Journalists Should Not Cover an Online Conspiracy Theory. Next, we have Alex Halivay, who is an associate professor at Arizona State University's School of Social and Behavioral Sciences. His work includes ex examining online communities, in particular Reddit. And then finally, we have Ali Breland, who is the disinformation reporter for Mother Jones. In August, he wrote an article called The Summer QAnon Went Mainstream. So thank you all for being here with us today. Ali, I want to start with you. Um, this is a question that could have an extremely long answer, but, but briefly, what is QAnon? QAnon is this conspiracy theory um, that alleges that there is a satanic cabal of elite pedophiles who are running a child sex ring in secret, and that they are locked in a battle with President Donald Trump, who is also being thwarted by the deep state, which is like a sort of um, hyperbolic term for entrenched government bureaucrats who are unelected. Um, who are fighting Donald Trump's efforts to stop this fictional pedophile cabal. Um, and without getting too deeply into the weeds of it, um, it kind of started originally as this conspiracy theory that there was a restaurant in DC that uh, elite liberals were, were running a child sex ring out of. Um, this is easily debunked, but it's sort of uh, on, on message boards like 4chan and 8chan morphed into this larger conspiracy about um, just everything I just said in that sprawling world. And it's, um, yeah, that's that's the baseline of it. Like you said, it could go on forever. Yes, yeah, so there are many permutations. I think one thing about QAnon that's interesting is it seems like you can sort of believe the parts of it you want to believe in, which may have helped expand its spread um, even internationally as we've seen fairly recently. So, I mean, initially, how did the social networks respond to QAnon as it began kind of filtering through their systems? So in the case of Reddit, um, in about 2018, maybe within a few months to like a year after it started, Reddit was pretty quick to, to take down all of these um, sorts of affiliated communities, subreddits that were devoted to the conspiracy. Um, 
but surprisingly almost, or I guess not surprisingly given everything we've seen, technology companies like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube just kind of stood by and watched it happen over the past two years. And, and so initially they didn't really do anything. Um, you could easily see recommendations for queuing on Facebook groups if, if you touch sort of adjacent territory or join Facebook groups uh, for QAnon, like others would pop up. The same thing happened on YouTube. Um, and only recently these companies, uh, Facebook and Twitter, started to take minor sort of piecemeal steps to curbing the spread of QAnon content. But there's a lot of reporting now all the time about how this is just like um, falling short and not really doing much to stymie the spread of it. Uh, Alex, I want to turn to you. I mean, I think it's really interesting that Reddit acted so much earlier than other social networks in terms of trying to kind of contain QAnon. Um, can you tell us maybe why Reddit perhaps acted more quickly and what the response to their action might have been? I can try. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think the source of this often is, uh, as Ali said, the, the image boards and Reddit tends to be the place where it's amplified. Um, and Reddit, unfortunately, has a long history of amplifying some of these voices in interesting ways. So uh, I think part of it is that, that they, they had recognized some of these patterns. The degree to which they've been successful in that, I think, is a, an open question. So um, it, as of, you know, kind of on an, on an ongoing rolling basis, they've been killing off subreddits, which are kind of subgroups within Reddit, the same as Facebook groups or something like that, um, that might have something to do with Q. Uh, they've done some, uh, they've made some efforts at going beyond that, but you know, even this week they've, they've killed another uh, sort of a, uh, uh, anti, uh, whatever. <laughs> they've killed another group that's in, it's, it's somehow in the fringes of the, of the, of the Q movement. And so um, they made that attempt, but some of this is, uh, I don't know. I, 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 uh, I wonder how much of the work can be done on the platforms. It's, uh, it's important. I think, so I, I it feels like uh, forest management, right? Uh, forest management is really important to stopping forest fires. And that's kind of gotten lost in the, in the current forest fire piece. It really is but there's only so much it can do when the climate has changed significantly. And so uh, I think that is the the big piece here, which is I think platforms can do something and they should do something, but as Reddit has shown, Q is still fairly uh, fairly popular among discussions. And so there's only so much you can do to shut it down without actually amplifying it as well. Excuse me, Whitney, you know, of course, journalism is the other part of this equation. I think that Hughes or Rise has probably depended on journalism almost as much as the social networks. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the mistakes you saw as journalists began to cover QAnon uh, two, three years ago? Well, so before I get to that, I want to um, add a little bit about the origin story of QAnon because that speaks to the journalistic responses, both good and less good and um, not good at all. But so Pizzagate um, emerged, that was Hillary Clinton um, and co were running a satanic child sex ring out of the back of a Washington DC pizza shop. I've had to say that line so many times over the last few years, I haven't memorized. Um, but Pizzagate emerged, that was in 2016. And that was getting a lot of play at the time. It was part of, it was the tail end of the election because it was October. Um, and it happened right around, it happened in response to, um, and was really sort of exacerbated by uh, the John Podesta email leak because then people pouring through the WikiLeaks email dump were then seeing what folks were calling um, evidence of these rings because there was reference to pizza. It kind of emerged out of that. The reason that that's important is that there could not have been a deep state conspiracy really in the way that it ultimately came to, came to be understood because Trump was not yet president. And so Pizzagate was sort of a confined, it wasn't confined, it was butting up against um, pre-existing conspiracy theories, most notably the satanic panics of the 80s and 90s. But it really wasn't until the Mueller report um, or the Mueller investigation was opened in May of 2017 that Pizzagate essentially became retconned um, into the broader deep state narrative because the concept of deep state had existed. Um, it was a term that was in the world, but it wasn't really until 2017, and Anna Merlin talks about this in her excellent book um, about conspiracy theories, but she talks about how it wasn't really until the Mueller investigation was opened that people then started connecting these dots. And so all of the existing energies that had swirled around Pizzagate, and there was quite a lot, 
then became roped into this story about QAnon as it emerged. And watching um, QAnon unfold over the last few years, I wrote a chapter, my co-author and I, Ryan Milner, have published a book on this. Um, and we have an entire chapter on conspiracy theories and QAnon. And the, what was happening is that QAnon is kind of amorphous in some really critical ways. And so it's been able to absorb and latch onto the energies of unfolding news stories as they've happened. So the Mueller investigation became a source of energy for this. Then you had the Epstein revelations was an enormous source of energy for this. Then it even was feeding into and fed by impeachment and then feeding into and fed by COVID. And so as we were trying to write this chapter, talking about journalistic coverage of it, all part of the problem is that QAnon has latched itself to everywhere. And that's partly why it's been so hard now, especially not to cover it, because it's, it's connected to all of the major stories that people are needing to cover. And so you can't really separate out QAnon as it's emerged as not even really a narrative, but sort of a worldview, journalistic coverage of the, the narrative itself, the worldview itself, and then all of these unfolding news stories that have been impossible to avoid. And so it really is, we describe it in the chapter in terms of a hurricane. It's sort of a perfect storm of everyday people's energies, um, energies of journalists, energies of technology companies. You can't really tease one thing out from the other. And that's what has made this a uniquely vexing conspiracy theory wraparound worldview paradigm to respond to effectively. Interesting that you compare it to a storm. Alex just compared it to a, a wildfire. You know, I think there is this sense that is, it's just this enormous force now um, that is a little bit challenging to try to, try to wrap your arms around. And um, that makes it difficult to think about how we can talk about it responsibly, how we can, what we can actually request of social networks short of, sh sort of, short of <laughs> shutting down altogether because it's, um, it's not a game of whack-a-mole, you know, all the moles are coming up together. So um, I'm curious for, for all of you, like, do you keep any principles in mind as you're approaching this? Do you, are there things that you wish journalists and platforms were doing a bit differently in terms of more of the forest management as opposed to responding to the fire? respond to that and I also want to say uh, that you know journalists are not a monolithic category and some folks have been doing really really great thoughtful work um, the entire time um, some folks have maybe uh, been feeding into some of the problematic aspects of the story so I don't want to paint I don't want to say that all journalists are doing x y or z but I think that not just re in regards to QAnon but every um, problematic polluted story that emerges. I think the number one thing that I wish I saw more of, I have, I mean, there, I think that this has become more common. Um, this is good over the last few years, but still, um, I think it's really critical not to lose track of the fact, whether we're a journalist, whether we're an academic or an everyday person, no one stands outside of the storms that we're describing. That you cannot step outside of QAnon and write about it in a detached, um, totally objective way, because just engaging with the discourse is going to be furthering those energies. And that's not to say that if you write about QAnon, you're necessarily making the problem worse by default, but QAnon uh, sort of thrives off of energy. And anything that gives it energy is going to bring it to, to new places. Um, and that can, that is ambivalent. It could potentially, you know, clear up some questions that folks might have while at the same time, um, maybe convincing people who think that you or your reporting or your institution is part of the deep state um, and that might just further entrench the belief. So we all, all of us, even everyday people, um, we are contributing as we are speaking and keeping that in mind that doesn't mean there's a one size fits all response for how we should do it, but never losing track of that I think can guide some of our thinking about how we respond, if we respond, to whom we respond, um, that, that can at least minimize the amount of pollution that's produced. Just to, I mean, I, I, uh, I want to divide out this question of, of what can journalists do to cover QAnon um, from the broader what can journalists do. And, I, and, I, and I, I think, as Whitney said, I think there's some journalists doing great work out there, but I think there's some systemic issues with journalism that help to feed this. Um, and, and so, you know, 
honestly, what can journalism, journalism do better um, that could on a systemic level approach this? And that is uh, making better use of investigative, re investigative reporting, um, heavier use of, of, of uh, evidence, uh, checking stories, not relying entirely on, on, on statements, you know, some of these things that are, that we've lost because of the news cycle. And so, um, you know, I'm a con I'm I'm kind of a conspiracy theorist, right? Like I'm a social scientist. I look for deep patterns. So you know that in and of itself, I think is is something that we could actually leverage by saying, okay, that's a good thing to do. Ask questions, but but what do we do about evidence? And so I know this is like one of those big questions of like let's fix all of journalism to fix QAnon. But I think rather than the question of focusing on QAnon, um, there might be something here to to do with uh, taking a look at some of these deeper issues that may very well be conspiracies and then say, this is how we deal with evidence when approaching these questions. So, yeah. When well, I sort of- Please go ahead, Ollie. When I sort of approach these things, like as, as a reporter, um, I am very, uh, I guess I like, I do, I'm very aware of the fact of what Winnie talks about and how like, everyone who like engages with it is a participant and is giving it oxygen in some way and so I try to like make sure that they're I don't have like a firm way of like doing a calculus for it but I try to make sure that there is some like ball trade off of it there is some like sort of justice component there's an accountability component and I think that those stories are, are really useful um uh Kelly Wheel at the Daily Beast did a really good story recently on how like ex Navy SEALs are getting into QAnon and, and that's a really important story. These people are like lauded within their communities. They're considered authority figures. Um, in some cases, some of them are prone to taking their own action, which could, could be violent and like affect real human lives, um, which she covers. Um, I'm about to do a story on how some police officers are getting into QAnon. Um, so I think like focusing things in those kinds of ways and not just like highlighting um, the absurdity of it are really useful. And that's just like one type of useful story. There's like other stories that have been done that don't fit neatly into that specific paradigm. Yeah, I mean, and I think that, that's definitely a trap that I, I think I've seen people fall into is focusing on the absurdities instead of focusing on the real world effects, right? Like it's easy to point and laugh at someone you think is saying something dumb, but when you're doing that, you might be ignoring somebody who is who has some sort of authority or is otherwise exercising some kind of power and their worldview is informing it. Um, you know, Ali, you mentioned accountability, which I think is a really interesting question um, in terms of when we think about it in terms of giving energy. So what we have seen a lot of is some praise, but also criticism of Facebook and Twitter for finally taking action and Reddit for having earlier taken action to sort of shut down these conversations on their platform. But in doing so, aren't they sort of feeding into this worldview itself? I mean, is there any way for the platforms to kind of navigate that challenge? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, mean, I mean, they are, but like, I think that ultimately the only way to like, not the only way, but a, a key part of maybe what is like one of the few paths out of this is for them to do things. Um, I'm like less concerned about them elevating the conspiracies of the conspiratorial mindset of QAnon people by like making them feel ostracized than I am um, of them not doing enough. I, I think that they're still like gaping holes in how they uh, moderate these communities and how they stop harassment. Um, and yeah, there, there certainly is that issue, but like ultimately like you deplatform these things like not anytime soon will they die because QAnon I think has already hit this like sort of critical mass point but in the long term I think that these are like difficult things that have to be done now that might cause a bit of like short-term pain um, that will like ultimately be most most useful in the end hopefully. Uh, what sort of gaps um, have you noticed those sort of those holes that you think they, they should be focusing on for now? Was there something you want to say Whitney? Oh, oh, no, um, I will, I can add on after you answer this question, because I'm curious to hear what you have to say. Yeah, there's still like a ton of groups. Um, you can see social media posts, all, or like Twitter posts all the time from researchers who are like, I'm still getting recommended to QAnon groups. That's happening to me as well. Um, I can still join a lot really easily. Um, Facebook is a very vague threshold for like what QAnon groups do and don't get banned. And it seems to be based off of some sort of I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure like what the full metric is. Um, I imagine it's probably an absolute nightmare for the low-paid contract worker moderators who have to deal with it because they're just like 
their heads are probably spinning with all these sort of weird caveats that Facebook is laying down. Um, Twitter, for example, can't stop um, this one Twitter account that's one of the most famous QAnon Twitter accounts. He keeps coming back. He's posting all of his new accounts on Instagram. Um, they haven't figured out that they can just go there and see at where he where he's making new accounts. He keeps racking up tens of thousands of followers off each account before they get banned again for uh, for Twitter's ban evasion policies, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, so that was sort of what I was going to speak to a little bit too. I mean, the thing about QAnon, I wish that I could say if we take X, Y, and Z steps over the course of the next two weeks, that within a fortnight we will have solved the problem. We already failed the test. QAnon is a stress test. Our systems failed it. It's uh, how we try to mitigate that now and deal with the pollution now. That's really a challenge. But I think that what QAnon points us to is the fact that there was this stress test that has been failed. Um, and, and so now we have to start thinking systemically what went wrong and what can be fixed in the future. So again, short-term solutions, um, that's really tricky in figuring out, you know, how do you, how do you moderate? How do you deal with it on a, on a day, -day, day by day basis? I'm not saying that that's not important, but it's the long-term structural problems that brought us to this moment that we have to figure out a way to address. And part of that is the opacity of algorithms and of recommendation tools generally. We have to figure out, I mean, there has to be more transparency there because part of the issue is once somebody starts looking for QAnon or QAnon related content, because it's a whole suite of, of information, some of which is very extreme and some of which seems a little more innocuous. Um, once someone starts going down that rabbit hole, they keep getting fed more and more. And it is not unreasonable for a person who begins doing research and homework in earnest and then arrives in this sort of magical world, right, where all of the evidence they're seeing is confirmatory of the belief. Why would they not then believe that there was something to it? Of course they would. They're being docented towards lots of what looks like evidence. The evidence does not correspond to objective reality, but it creates the illusion of that. And so there needs to be something done at the recommendation level, at the algorithmic level, so that people are not so deeply brought into these rabbit holes that they can't even see that they're in them anymore. And until we figure out a way to address that, the incentives of the attention economy and all of the ways that these bad things make these companies lots of money, we will be having the same conversations again and again about different stories from here until the end of time. And so it is time now for structure. It's basically, and I've, I've advocated for this elsewhere, we're kind of at a place where we need a Green New Deal for the digital age. Um, like that's where we are, that until we're dealing with the structural stuff, you know, it's never gonna change. And that's what makes answering these questions, dealing with these issues so daunting and overwhelming and exhausting because it's not a button we can push. It's not, we tweak moderation a little bit and then we solve it or, you know, journalism practices, we just maybe change how we write headlines and then the problem is solved. Like it is so much deeper than that um, and so much bigger than any of, any of us are. And that's what makes me um, tired. Can I jump in there real quick? Yeah, just to tag onto that. Absolutely on, on the algorithmic tra transparency. Um, but even more than that, I mean, so I've been looking recently at kind of uh, Reddit neighborhoods. So there are kind of bad neighborhoods and good neighborhoods on Reddit. Uh, that's really an oversimplification, but people do tend to stick with their own. And, and some of that clustering is algorithmic and some of it's just kind of a natural people flock together. Uh, again, transparent algorithms that tried to break that down could actually help this quite a bit. So uh, for example, I'm looking at a, at a in a given month, something like 28,000 people submitted to the Donald, which is now a, a dead group, but but it, at that point was a, a very popular group and, and, and roughly the same, a little bit less submitted to a group called Change My View. There were only about 261 who crossed over that great divide between Change My View, which is a group where people kind of uh, are required to use evidence and argumentation and kind of are, are required to come together on around things and discuss them. Only about, you know, a couple hundred people, and I'm shocked that it was even a couple of hundred people made that crossover. So one of my quick big questions is whether you kind of code switch. If you're on the Donald and go to change my view, do you adopt that set of expectations around discussion or not? And so if you could, um, again, in a transparent way, uh, have people 
you know, shop from Change My View to the Donald or to QAnon Spaces, that would make sense. I, um, so yeah, I, I, I think there are some things we can do for, for moderation around especially violent content, which is what, what a lot of the uh, stuff that has, has worked reasonably well on Reddit and at, on Twitter. This is tricky because that means that you're, you, it's hard to deplatform the current administration. And so this becomes very tricky. So this, this week's um, drops from Q are very heavily pushing insurrection um, and, and you know, violent insurrection. And so those kinds of, of messages are terroristic in intent. And so I think that there are, are some things you can do that when you start to tread across that line, you can do moderation that makes, that's very explicit and very clear and has nothing to do with content you know is content neutral but says that anybody who's who's anybody who's advocating for for violent insurrection at least in the united states this still gets tricky um could could be in some way you know violating these policies but on a broader sense i think that we can look at ways of of making platforms that that pull people together um across these boundaries and that may do something especially in places where there is this more rational or open uh, discussion that might actually help some of this. And just to clear, so I, I think we said this in the introduction to what Q is, but just in case we didn't, the drops are how Q communicates. Um, Q drops these clues and then the followers are supposed to sort of investigate them and see where they fit into the greater conspiracy and what they might be suggesting is coming next. Is that roughly right, Ali? Yeah, and the other thing too that I, I guess I forgot to mention is that Q is purportedly like a government insider. Um, so the contradiction, right, is that like the deep state of government insiders is at war with Donald Trump and their enemies, but there are like white hat deep staters who are inside the government um, who are, are good and Q is like a good person who is inside the federal government and the reference the name q is like a reference to um a very high level security clearance so this this person like according to them knows like a lot about what's happening inside the government um the accuracy of the information they provide would suggest otherwise but um that's what they claim yeah i i had a, a thought i mean as i was trying to think of you know what how to prepare for this conversation reflecting on you know what some of the similar what's changed in in the reporting over the last few years um and and i kept returning to something that i that i encountered when i was doing some research working with journalists um talking about the rise of uh, white nationalism and supremacy and in the way in the lead up to and wake of the 2016 election particularly following charlottesville and one of the journalists who i spoke to for this project was saying you know since Charlottesville, he felt that journalists had become more adept at knowing how to handle low level small fish trolls. So when it was sort of, you know, these like random people on Twitter saying, you know, racist incendiary things, journalists had gotten better at knowing what to do. But the problem point and the pain point for these journalists was that when the person saying those things was the president, um, that poses a different level of complication in how and whether you report. And that's the same thing with QAnon. Um, one of the things that's been pretty fascinating in the work that I've done studying the sort of emergence of the, of the worldview narrative paradigm thing um, is that for many, many years, Trump was, although he was always uh, he never repudiated it. Um, he's always kind of had one toe in the deep state um, circle that's kind of, you know, that's been part of his personal brand, right? Um, but he hasn't really outright embraced it until recently. I mean, in 2018, he gave an interview um, that, that has stuck with me where he said, I don't like using the term deep state because it sounds so conspiratorial. Well, two weeks ago or however many weeks ago, because time doesn't exist anymore, he said that, you know, the, the deep state i.e. the FDA was going to be delaying the vaccine because they wanted to undermine Trump's presidency. So, and he more explicitly, more frequently, more unabashedly has been retweeting QAnon stuff, not that that's brand new, but he's really like leaning on this as an election strategy. So I think what I have observed is many journalists have been more careful about how they engage with QAnon participants, adherents, uh, propagators, um, but when the president 
is the one who is propagating the theory and, and not just propagating it, but laying the groundwork essentially to delegitimize the outcome of the 2020 election, that becomes a totally different conversation that isn't just about the specifics of QAnon, but the way that QAnon, so, you know, um, what Alex was just saying about how it's a call for, I, I forget what one of you was just saying um, about calls for insurrection. What do you do when the president is doing that? either implicitly or explicitly. How do you report on that? Um, and that's something that, that to me still feels very vexing for journalists. It's vexing to me. You know, when I study, I look at the ethics of amplification. Trump has shifted his, his um, re-elect strategy to um, embracing this particular conspiracy theory. So that's different. Uh, takes it to a new place. And that's what makes it so difficult, again, to, to figure out how do we respond in a week, because he's going to still be saying this through the election. Um, a very quick side question from uh, one of our audience members. Ali, could you repeat the name of the author of the Daily Beast article you recently, you just mentioned? Um, yeah, it's Kelly. I think it's pronounced Wheel. It's like W-I-E-L-L -L or W-E-I-L-L. -L. Um, if you just type in like Daily Beast and ABC story, it will come up. Thank you. And um, audience members, we are keeping an eye on the questions and we will move to the formal Q&A part in about nine minutes. So keep sending in your fantastic questions. Um, one question that I have is like, how much does it matter the way we refer to QAnon? So um, I think some places call it a baseless conspiracy theory. Some people call it a far right conspiracy theory. Um, BuzzFeed News recently said that it will be referring to it as a, a, a shared delusion or something like that. I can't remember. I have to look it up. I mean, is there like a way in which this characterization makes a difference? My thoughts on this, I've thought about this a lot because like, as I write, I'm like thinking about it. I saw the BuzzFeed thing um, where they decided to call it a collective delusion. Um, and like, Say for like, I think at this point, like it doesn't make sense to call it a fringe theory anymore, but it's because it's not, but like calling it like a far right conspiracy, even though it's mainstream, calling it a collective delusion, calling it a baseless conspiracy is all um, descriptive and useful. I think that I, where I get like a little bit wary is like when publications want to throw down, which this isn't a common thing. I think BuzzFeed is the only one that kind of did this. That where they throw down like a the common an edict being like we're gonna refer to this like mostly as a collective delusion, that kind of stuff concerns me in that like that using terms that like make it dismiss it a little bit I think are maybe not the most useful way of framing it. It is something that is absolutely ridiculous, but like the impacts are real and not ridiculous at all, and so like you have to thread a line in how you describe it. Um, for the most part, I think people do a good job. Um, it just goes back to like not being dismissive and like understanding it's real and it's here. Do you have a, a preferred shorthand that you use in your reporting? I think just like right-wing conspiracy theory, um, but I, I've used all of those um, at different points because you can't write that over and over and over. Uh, I mean, I'm curious to hear that a lot. Um, Alex, and then what do you think about that? I, I think it's really tricky. I, I hope, sorry, Whitney, I don't hope I didn't jump on that, but uh, I think it's, I, I don't think there's a good answer to this. I, I mean, my, my concern is in part that, that uh, like deplorables, uh, it can be worn as a badge per, fairly easily. And, and, I, and I kind of am concerned that it could radicalize those who are, who feel like they've been pigeonholed into this group. I mean, I have, I have extended family who would not say I am a member of QAnon, but who then, you know, there was a, there were a bunch of nationwide arrests around pedophilia. And so when your friends share that and, and are asking, why isn't it being more, more uh, widely covered? That's certainly an indication that they're leaning in that direction. And so do I then say, okay, you're part of a, you're part of a right wing common delusion or do you not? And so I, I worry a little bit about the radicalization of, of insisting that anyone who is not, I mean, certainly there's this core, right, which is the satanic baby eating conspiracy. Um, and then there's this, this revolution of the things that, as Whitney has said, has kind of been rolled up into it, which are people 
who tend to lean right, and that's a very large portion of the population. So, so that's my, I don't have an answer to that. That's my non-answer, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think we, that's something we've seen a lot recently, particularly sort of following the pandemic, um, which has been kind of this inflection point. Um, it seems like there's a now a movement to sort of aim toward white suburban women by focusing on this sort of save the children message, um, making this not about the deep state, but about saving children seems to have become a way that it, people are actually going to actual streets. We're seeing in-person protests happening that have been organized online and then local journalists cover that. And it's a little bit tough to say, no, 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 we can't talk about child abuse, you know, the, it, there's a way in which now they are sort of protecting themselves a bit. And um, Whitney, I would love to hear your thoughts on this transition and particularly how local journalists could handle it. It's very tricky. Um, and part of the reason that it is, is that you have a lot of people who are concerned about the children and are taken in for uh, into the more sort of innocuous sounding parts of, of the narrative. And whether or not, you know, those elements explicitly are referring to the deep state, they're not, but it still is implicitly, you've got this cadre of high profile people, typically men, um, who are actively trying to cover up these crimes against children. So that's not the deep state explicitly, but it, I mean, but it kind of is. And, and that happens to correspond with some actual things that have actually happened in the world. I mean, Jeffrey Epstein was a real guy and he was real terrible. And so you can point to these data points that aren't actually connected, but they, but they look connected or from a particular framework, they seem like they could be at least. And so part of the, part of the concern about having QAnon sort of moving into those spaces is that people who otherwise might not be willing to jump wholesale into, you know, QAnon right away. That's an entry point. And then if, and this is the thing that really worries, worries me about BuzzFeed's choice and other kinds of choices to use dismissive denigrating language to talk about it. If you're a person who in good faith has started to pay attention to and be very worried about what you believe is happening to children around the country and globe, um, and you are passionate about this and you are coming from a place where you're just trying to help to be then lumped in with a group that is basically being called crazy, which is not only ableist, but is really sort of, um, it flattens a whole range of different kinds of beliefs and different entry points into the conversation. That is not going to typically make you be more sympathetic to the news coverage that's calling you a crazy person. And so then inadvertently, that could feed into the idea, not explicitly of the deep state, but you've got people who are trying to cover something up. Why aren't they covering up? Why aren't they talking about it? And so you can accidentally um, feed into some of the thinking that allows people to arrive at this belief and feel really good about themselves in this belief. And that's extremely tricky. And I think that when you're talking about local reporters, they're on the ground, they're interacting with folks who are at these rallies. I, it's really it's really tricky to figure out how you respond to someone. I mean, talking about the acknowledging the process of information laundering, um, the fact that QAnon is essentially being laundered through these other more innocuous, almost unassailable concerns, right? Like who's going to say, I don't want to protect the children? That's um, calling attention to that process and also being really careful to say, now, just because you're concerned about the children does not make you this like crazy conspiracy theory nut, like talking to people about how they get their information, why they get the information they do, why they feel they're surround, why they are surrounded by this kind of information. That's a better entry point into the discussion than look at all these, these crazy conspiracy theorists, because that's not how many of them see themselves. And so that's just going to be counterproductive from go. Um, that's actually a great opportunity for us to transition to our audience questions. Um, Sabra Ayers asked something that I've been thinking about a great deal, which is how can we quantify how many QAnon followers there are? How can we measure its spread? Is it even possible? And I, I think this is sort of part of where we get into this question of true believer versus somebody who's sort of on the fringes. There's a, a, a classification problem. Yeah, I mean, there's folks who, who uh, uh, 
Chuck Grassley, and this got, as part of the drop, Chuck Grassley has this video yesterday, day before, of him picking an ear of corn and saying the corn's about to be ready, which is a bizarre video anyway, but it's just open to conspiracies saying, yes, it's about to, you know, it pulls into this narrative so neatly that if I were Q, and I'm not, um, if I were Q, I would, I would have linked uh, to that. But, um, uh, you know, there are, if you look at the, the Twitter stream after that, it's like, we're, you know, Q brought me here. Like, so there is that very explicit where you could go out and start to count people saying I'm Q, right? But I don't think that would be a very useful, a useful metric. Um, I guess not to be like the horrible pedantic pro professorial, but like, what's the use of counting these? You know, it, in some ways it reinforces the idea that it's a movement that isn't a movement. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I guess the question is like, it depends on why you're counting them. Um, if you're counting it because it's a, an effort to see how much misinformation is happening in the sort of wider information environment, that's a hard problem to solve, but I think a really worthwhile one. If it's just kind of doing a head count of Q followers, I'm not sure what that does for us. Uh, yeah, I would, oh, sorry. Nope. Uh, thanks. Uh, so in my reporting, like I've, I've talked to a lot of QAnon people in real life at MAGA rallies and like at Trump rallies and, um, there is definitely a range. Like sometimes you'll come across someone who like you ask them, like you believe there's like a pedophile ring. So like, yeah, and you ask them, do you believe JFK is real? And they'll be like, not only do I believe that, but I believe that like the front man of Lincoln Park um, who died was uh, John Podesta's son and is involved in this conspiracy. And it's like some other just outlandish stuff you've never even heard of, even as someone like who follows this. Um, but then there are people who like, uh, I talked to this guy who was like, scarily enough like a federal um, law enforcement agent who was wearing like a bunch of QAnon slogans at the rally and had signs and everything and I talked to him and we, we talked and he was like honestly like I don't think the pedophile conspiracy is real um, but I think he was right about a lot of stuff and I think the anti-corruption message is good um, so it is really hard to define um, there are sort of like rough numbers we can look to polling has QAnon support somewhere between like five percent and like I want to say like in the teens, um, these polls, you know, can be questioned for a number of reasons. It's hard, but that would indicate like, depending on what, what groups they're trying to be proxies for, that's like hundreds of thousands to even like low millions of people. But again, like what parts do they believe in? Like what does Q mean to them? Um, that's really hard to get. Yeah, for me, so I'm less interested in the people who would identify themselves with the movement and who are, you know, staunch QAnon supporters, they're all in. Um, what I'm more interested in and more concerned about are the pretty normalized, pretty deeply mainstream, pretty well established ideologies that set people up to be amenable to uh, the QAnon narrative and other kinds of deep state narratives. I mean, you know, QAnon might sound pretty extreme and it is pretty extreme, but the idea of the globalist leftist media kind of conspiring against real Americans, that's um, pretty well entrenched within a lot of far right thinking and has been for decades. And, you know, folks who are already kind of inclined to believe that, I mean, they may not have ever called it the deep state, but that there's some group of sort of not really real Americans, which is usually code, you know, it's usually anti Semitic code, right? Um, but that there's some group of people who are sort of calling the shots and who don't care about real America, um, that's, that's pretty much a given for many, many people. And if the extent to which you believe that, um, that's really going to influence how much credence you're willing to give the sort of lower level, less extreme sort of deep state stuff um, all the way up to Q. Because remember, I mean, this is all a lot of COVID denialism, even when it is not explicitly referencing the deep state or QAnon, it's drawing from the same sort of narrative trough. Um, it is, you have this cabal, again, it's always a cabal, sort of internal enemies trying to downplay or uh, overblow the uh, significance of COVID. You know, maybe COVID is a hoax, maybe it was man-made, maybe it's just being exaggerated to hurt Trump's election chances. Again, that's not a very rare um, perspective for, for many people to have. And so it's, for me, it's, it's those kind of ideological leanings that then make the more extreme QAnon seem more plausible because you're already kind of halfway there. Um, that I think is, I don't know how to calculate that number and I don't wanna try because that would be 
that would be quite concerning. And it is not, it's not the case that it's just right-leaning folks. Um, one of the things that's been particularly interesting about QAnon, also as, especially as it's collided with COVID, is that you have a lot of sort of anti-vaxxers and other sort of wellness types who otherwise wouldn't fit in the MAGA universe. You wouldn't think that they would go there. They're, they're also kind of falling into some of these thought patterns. Whether they're going full QAnon is, is a question, but this idea that the doctor, you can't trust the doctors, you can't trust public health experts, you can't trust the government, um, you know, that that's something that Th those two groups might start from different places, but ultimately they arrive at the same conclusion, which is that you can't trust the official version of events. Um, and it ultimately stems from this fundamental mistrust in establishment anything. So, you know, the, I guess for me, it's sort of the, the extent to which you, you don't trust institutions, that's going to be more of a predictor for whether or not you end up kind of going down some of these paths. How far you get is, is the question. But that's, again, a huge number of people across the country. And so just figuring out what to do about QAnon itself doesn't address all those underlying issues. Um, and I think those underlying issues are really where we get into a lot of trouble. I, can I just pile on Please. to that real quick? Yeah, because I, I think this is a really important piece to note, which is that you know we have a long history of, of people who have wacky ideas often from the left and often kind of created that way um, because there is the, the strong belief that elites have control that uh, thwarts democratic processes. I mean, going some of this is kind of constructed and really weird, you know, uh, things like levitating the Pentagon. You know, are you serious about that? And this is the yippies and the whole movement through the 60s and 70s and 80s. And, you know, so there, the left has kind of owned some of this for a long time in terms of kind of, uh, uh, picking up on on core both uncertainty and we're in an extraordinarily uncertain period not just because of covid but because of uh, a lack of of basic understanding of of who the um are and 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 kind of confusion around that and then frankly deep ep economic issues and and a lot of this pl uh, kind of plays on those deep economic issues the reason that the working class in america is is put down is not because of kind of deep structural issues around capitalism but because there is a a, a group of and this feeds into the kind of anti-semitic bankers you know there's a group of globalists who are seeking to keep you down and so it you know QAnon in some ways is an explanation that is that is attractive to a group that that probably has very legitimate um critiques of the way that they have found themselves. So like the, the, the environment here is ripe for um, someone to move in and kind of uh, attract people to these ideals. And, and you know, so it is in, in a sense in that you are attaching an ideology to a set of very real concerns by a very large proportion of Americans. And I think that it is, you know, the fact that we have so that are attaching to this is in some ways surprising because they want an explanation and a solution and QAnon is offering that to them and, and it is traditional kinds of scapegoating and and you know uh, stuff that kind of has flowed to the right but it could just as easily be pulling a whole group of people because the the field has been laid for this mm -hmm. absolutely all right, our next question comes from Rachel Myrao. Um, she asks, when your reporting is attacked by QAnon supporters on Twitter, should you respond or does that just pour more fuel on the brush fire? Uh, I, I usually don't respond. Um, like, it, it, it's like uh, playing whack-a-mole on like an acre of land. Um, it, it will never end. Um, like if there's like maybe some one-off instance where you can see something constructive that could come from it or like something like that, sure, go for it. But like, uh, generally, no, I, I have better things to do. Um, I, there's just too much going on to like spend time on that. Do you have any thoughts on someone who has studied trolls a great deal? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, because I've been doing this work for 12 years, um, I'm one of the things that's emerged from that is I'm really reluctant to tell people how they should or should not respond. Um, what they feel comfortable with, what's appropriate for their life um, is going to vary across populations, especially, you know, what might be okay for uh, a particular reporter 
um, maybe because of the body that they were born into or um, the position that they hold at that institution, maybe there would be less risk in engaging as someone who, you know, is a freelancer or who is a member of a marginalized community who's going to get piled on in a different kind of way. So it really depends on who the reporter is and what the circumstances are. But the one thing that I would say there is that we have failed our journalists when the solutions have to be framed in terms of individual response rather than structural response. That journalists should be protected by their um, publications and should have structures in place and support systems in place that they can draw from when this happens. And it is a great tragedy. It's a labor issue for individual people to be put in a position where they have to make a choice. Are they going to engage or are they not going to engage? Some folks might have the support that they need, but many folks don't. And so it's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of response. And we need to, and this is true in, in response to, to that question, and it's true in response to the QAnon issue generally, that we need to be thinking about structural sh solutions rather than individual solutions because as long as we're stuck at the individual level we're not going to get to why we are here which is all of these systemic structural failures so um it uh, i don't i don't know what an individual would need to do in a hypothetical situation i would need to talk to them and would also want to offer them a hug over zoom because that sucks um and and reporters put themselves at grave risk and particularly, you know, reporters of color, trans reporters, reporters who already are experiencing a great deal of heat on them. Um, it's not an easy job and they often don't have the support that they need. So um, just say thank you for doing that work. And I'm sorry that it's like this. Absolutely. Our next question is from MK Kellogg, who says, it seems that there might be some evidence that Q is coming from Russia. Is there anything to support the idea that um, Russia either is responsible for Q or perhaps just amplifying Q QAnon content? I think that it's, it's pretty clear that it is a um, fissure that could be easily exploited by Russia, mm -hmm. by uh, interest in political interests more broadly. Uh, so I don't, I haven't personally seen any very clear evidence that it is, you know, uh, the, the, the remnants of the IRA or, or some very clear kind of uh, influence by, by Russians or other not, uh, state actors or non-state actors. That said, it is kind of a, an open, an open trough from which you could draw and, and, and manipulate because, you know, the, the process of asking questions, which is kind of the cue, you know, uh, engaging seekers is kind of the, uh, as a rhetorical device, is, is an outstanding way of, of gathering people around to Q. But it's also a great way of, of opening up uh, the opportunity for exploitation. So uh, yeah, I haven't seen anything explicit, but it would not surprise me. I, I would be shocked if they were not trying to leverage that. I would also say that like, it is important and certainly like worthy of knowing, but like our approach to it and like trying to deal with it and combat it shouldn't factor um, those kinds of considerations in that much like the IRA was really successful at drawing out um, like racial tensions in 2016 and like targeting certain communities and like the things that they were amplifying were real problems that were just under addressed and like the answer wasn't was never to just say like oh you know it's Russians pointing out the racism so like we can't handle it. it's to actually like point out the problems that are undergirding it and I'm really worried that if like Russia is like seen to be amplifying QAnon in a way that like people will find it to be like sufficient to say, oh no, this is like a Russian plot and then like dismiss the argument based on that. That's not going to be convincing. It's, it's just going to like make the sort of discourse around it um, very low quality and very muddy. Uh, somebody asked what is probably the number one question around um, who is Q? I think my sort of add on to that question would be, does that even matter at this point? I don't even know if it matters to a lot of QAnon supporters. Um, like, I think it was Adrienne LaFrance's, I, I hope I'm saying her last name right, uh, Atlantic piece um, that was like really comprehensive. Um, she asked a lot of people this and like, even if Q was found to be like fake or something, they're like, oh no, it's beyond that. It's like a movement. Um, it's a community. Um, it extends like beyond just like the individual person. Some people would be disillusioned if it came out to be fake, but um, I don't know. I, it's created a world beyond beyond like Q itself, beyond whoever the Q poster is. Mm 
You just have. I don't even. I don't know what fake would mean in this context, right? Because uh, the, 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 what's really interesting about this is that it is an anonymous. You know. It, 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 like Anon, right? Like the anonymous movement, it, it, it leverages the fact of it being anonymous. Um, and I keep thinking back to Ender's Game where, where uh, you know, these two kids kind of anonymously change global politics. And so, um, you know, it opens up that really interesting question of like, you know, what is the strength of an an anonymous voice? Uh, but, you know, as, as, a, as a concept, I think it's really curious and interesting. But as the actual person writing the words, it's, it's I think, trivial. We have just five more questions, which is a lot because I or five more minutes and I could ask you guys about 25 more questions. So um, my colleague Anthony Wynn said, asks Alex, I know Reddit uses a larger set of tools, both from admins such as quarantines and community powered tools like the mod tools to police content that violates Reddit policy. Do you think that this type of more community driven self policing is effective at clamping down on what might be dangerous speech as opposed to something like Facebook, which does do something similar with groups or Twitter, which does not. So basically, how does the sort of like self policing aspect of Reddit play into Reddit's response to you. Yeah, so I think there's a couple. I'll, I'll just try to answer that briefly. I don't have an answer to that that is well thought out. But I, I will say briefly, I think it's interesting because there are there is this federated response, right? So on subreddits, people have done really interesting, I think that Reddit's great because you can look and see um, some really interesting experiments in moderation. And some of these say, we're moderating because we have to, because Reddit says we do. And some of that's just an authoritative piece that says Reddit's saying there are certain things we have to moderate. So that's what we're moderating. But a lot of them are doing interesting, making interesting moves on that. Now, the downside of that is that, uh, is that you know a thousand flowers bloom and, and if people don't like the moderation on a particular subreddit they can kind of just pop up a new subreddit and and this has been the problem of of reddit at a at a you know reddit wide level kind of just you know hitting a hammer on a on a bad subreddit is that it just sprouts up somewhere else so i think there is a balance to be held there i think that the interesting piece so i don't know that, that the solution is that kind of federated small groups uh keeping it going but i think that it is useful in that it gives us uh examples of things that might work within um coherent communities smaller communities and so some of those solutions may percolate up to uh, a broader level it's fascinating. Um, this is a long question, so I'm just going to, to summarize it briefly, and then we'll have one more question after this. Um, Kathleen Walsh asks, isn't legitimizing these conspiracists by tolerating their illegitimate, irrational, unfactual, unscientific views making the problem worse? This kind of gets into something that, Whitney, you've written about before, which is uh, whether debunking is a useful approach to this. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I wasn't before, and now I was. Um, we don't always, uh, as human beings, believe things because of facts very often, actually. And so throwing facts at someone when, especially when they've undergone a lot of work to arrive at a conclusion, it's simply not very likely that telling a QAnon believer, a true believer, that everything they believe is wrong, and here are all the facts supporting that, it's not likely that that's going to work for them. And in fact, it might backfire in the sense that they might see you challenging that belief and then rope you into the conspiracy that you're pushing back against them because clearly you're in on it somehow. Um, and, and so while it's, while I, I appreciate the spirit of the question, I really do. You know, why, why do we tolerate, why would we wanna to tolerate something that is just outright false? It's, it's less about holding hands with QAnon believers and more about recognizing that just spraying facts at people who have spent maybe a lifetime amassing a particular belief system, that's not very strategic. It's not going to work with them. And there could be unintended downstream consequences. So it's not about saying, it's not about refusing to say QAnon is false. QAnon is false. It's absolutely false. But there are reasons why believers get to that place of belief. And if we want to have any effort, if we want to make any headway in responding in a way that they could hear, we have to understand the context of how that belief emerges. So it's not coddling. It's not saying that facts don't matter. It's saying that this is a complex rhetorical 
belief structure system that constitutes an entire person's being and throwing a fact check at them isn't going to fix the problem. So we've got to look a little deeper than that, spend a little more time and maybe not call them crazy while we're trying to make sense of their world so that we can help and actually respond in a way that they can hear and maybe be willing to um, consider. I think, sadly, we are out of time for more questions, which is a shame because there were some great ones. Um, but I think this has been a really enlightening conversation, and particularly in the way it's sort of demonstrated that in a lot of ways, QAnon is more a case study of the significant problems facing content moderation for social networks, um, problems facing journalism, particularly in terms of resources that are available and the speed of the news cycle, uh, and just the political system. Um, it's really interesting to see how that all plays together, but also a little bit disheartening because it does make it seem like after QAnon, we may see something similar. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today. A special thanks, of course, to our fantastic speakers who for giving their time. Um, and audience members, thank you so much for joining us as well. I think um, if if you enjoyed today's event, you should also join us on Friday when we'll have three leading experts on police surveillance technologies with us for the launch event of the Policing and Technology Project, a new initiative from Future Tense and the Tech Law and Security Program at um, American University. And then next Wednesday, we will be talking about um, how government can rally scientists and other creators in terms of emergency um, and the problems that can emerge there. So we'll be contrasting what happened in World War II with um, the challenges that big tech companies are facing today when asked to cooperate with the US government. Um, Ali, Alex, Whitney, thank you all again so much for doing this and I will see you online.